what you can do if you encounter a child trapped in a hot car. And a woman dies after her pickup truck slides into a lake. The four states most watched news starts now. Good morning. Welcome to the KOAM Morning News, 5.30 on a Wednesday. I'm Dave Pilot. And I'm Tanya Bach. Coming up this half hour, a plea change for a man arrested for hindering prosecution in a Joplin homicide case. That's ahead. And why an advisory committee in Kansas City is recommending the city rebuild its international airport instead of renovating existing buildings. Right now, a check of the weather. Weather. And we do have some rain in the area. A few showers this morning from around Pittsburgh, east over to Lamar. And it looks like we're back into the summertime heat with our temperatures into the mid 90s, mainly dry weather here for um, after Thursday for the next uh, several days. The heat index again will be, be up around 100 degrees by the weekend. But boy, wasn't it a beautiful yesterday afternoon? I don't know if you were able to get out and enjoy that, but it was so nice that north wind. Lower humidity. I think somebody t was commenting to me, like, oh, they called for a cold front and we get this. I'm like, but this is cold uh, for us. Yeah, that's, <laughs> yeah. The way, that's the way it's supposed to work. All right, thanks, Dave. <laughs> What to do when a child is in distress? We see stories every year about stories every year about babies who've been left locked in a car. But when is breaking a window or trying to the best solution? The Joplin Police Department says your first move should be to call 911. After that, it's a matter of assessing the situation. If the child's moving around and sweating, that's a good sign. You know, if your child's red-faced, if they're very lethargic, not moving, shows they're more in more of a distress at that point. But if it comes time you have to break in that window or get access to the car, you just have to use whatever measures you have necessary to accomplish it at that time. It is legal in Missouri to leave a child over the age of 10 in your vehicle. Now, Kansas has no specific laws about leaving infants in a vehicle, although a parent could face charges of criminal negligence or child endangerment. Investigators say the death of a toddler in Newton County, Missouri was an in accident. And a neighbor was caring for 18-month-old Carly Nichols south of Joplin when the girl fell into a hot tub. These are good people that had a tragic accident. And uh, there will be a child death review board like there's on every child death in the state of Missouri. Uh, I don't anticipate anything further than that. The neighbor tried to revive the toddler with CPR but was unsuccessful. Authorities recover the body of a woman from her truck submerged in a lake. The victim, 52-year-old Venice Little of Minden Mines, Missouri. Now, Little was the owner of the convenience and liquor store Big Little Mini Mart on State Line Road outside of town. Little and two other women were at the Mulberry City Park Lake very early yesterday morning. The neighbors heard the sounds of a vehicle spinning out. Crawford County 911 dispatch crews to the lake where they found Little's pickup in the water. There were two passengers in the vehicle when the water, uh, when the truck entered the water. Both of them were able to uh, escape the vehicle before it became submerged, and their efforts to get Miss Little out of the vehicle were unsuccessful. Little's body has been sent to Kansas City for an autopsy. A man arrested for hindering prosecution in a Joplin homicide changes his plea. Aiden Bautista changed his plea to guilty and is sentenced to time served 15 days in the county jail. The charges stem from a homicide at this home back in November. Mascadano Lopez was found dead from blunt force trauma. He'd apparently been beaten in the head with a board. Leonardo Mendoza is charged with first-degree murder and armed criminal action in connection with his death. Bautista told police that he, the suspect, and the victim, who were all roommates, were assaulted by two black men. He later recounted this story. Neosho, Missouri police tracked down a man suspected of stealing six cars and attempting to steal a seventh from this Neosho dealership early Sunday. Police had little evidence and no suspects until Monday. That's when investigators say the alleged thief made a grab at a seventh car. As the suspect came to get the seventh vehicle, a friend of the business owner just happened to be driving by the dealership. He followed the car and alerted authorities. The owner of the dealership says he's just frustrated over the ordeal. You know, you work 17 years to get to this point to where you're at, where you can operate on your own and have a little bit of security, and then, you know, you get fifty, sixty thousand dollars worth of cars stolen. It's, it's, it's frustrating, but, you know, it's life. 
I'll, uh, I'll make it. Authorities are still looking to recover five vehicles. More arrests could be coming. A semi truck driver passing through the area is credited with reporting what police call animal abuse. It happened Monday at the Missouri FF and Interstate 49 intersection in Joplin. A semi driver told police he saw a man slapping and punching a dog with his fist and then kicking the dog. Joplin police say although the dog does not appear to be hurt, there was still cause for arrest based on what could have happened. I think it's going to be that things that might cause injury to the animal. Uh, Repetitive strikes. Um, you know, again, it's up to the judge. We'll hear from the truck driver who called police in our next half hour. Missouri Attorney General Chris Coster announces his office has opened an investigation into whether Planned Parenthood clinics in Missouri have violated state law. Planned Parenthood has been accused of illegally selling fetal organs. Following a month filled with severe weather, President Obama makes a federal disaster declaration for the state of Kansas. 41 counties, including Chautauqua, Cherokee, Elk, and Neosho, will receive federal funding. In Missouri, Governor Jay Nixon has requested federal aid for 68 of the 114 counties in the state. The governor is also requesting individual assistance for 15 of those counties, including Barry and McDonald counties. A Kansas City Advisory Committee recommends the city look to rebuild Kansas City International Airport into a single terminal instead of renovating existing buildings. City leaders say the airport can and must do better if it is going to handle the passenger workload of the future. It's a project funded by the airlines through user fees, but they'll borrow money from the city through bonds and not taxes for construction. It's 537. Here's the seven-day forecast. We do have some rain in the area this morning, and the chance for showers and thunderstorms will continue, but it won't be quite so hot today with a high of 84. That's a look at this morning's top stories and weather in our first seven minutes. Coming up on the KOAM Morning News, the Joplin Blasters look to take game two of a three-game series against the Laredo Lemurs. Highlights up next in sports. Plus, the father of a woman allegedly murdered by an undocumented immigrant testifies before a congressional hearing on America's immigration policies. And a war of words. Donald Trump continues his rhetoric despite calls for him to drop out of the race for president. You're watching the KOAM Morning News. More real news in the morning. We'll be right back. Welcome back. The Joplin Blasters dropped their first game of a seven-game road trip on Monday, falling 9-2 to Laredo. The Blasters and the Lemurs last night meeting up again for game two of their three-game series. Bottom of the first, Molina getting a strikeout. Now in the bottom of the third, no score yet, and another Molina strikeout. The next batter, more of the same. Later in the third, though, Laredo will get the bat to connect with the ball. Molina uh, knocking it down, firing it to first in time. Out of the bottom of the fourth, and Molina racking up another strikeout. He had seven strikeouts in eight innings, and this game would stay scoreless until the ninth, but Laredo would get the win on a walk-off, bases-loaded single. One to nothing, the final in that one. After throwing batting practice in a live game situation against the Pittsburgh Pirates Monday night, the Kansas City Royals have optioned opening day starter Jordano Ventura to AAA Omaha. Ventura's ERA has blown up from 3.2 last year to a little north of 5 this year. This offseason, Kansas City signed him to a five-year deal worth $23 million guaranteed after he helped the Royals advance to the World Series to take his spot on the team. The Royals reinstated left-handed starter Jason Vargas from the 15-day disabled list. Vargas last night getting the start for the Royals in Game 2 of the series against Pittsburgh. He only lasted one and a third innings before leaving with an elbow injury. However, the Royals do get the win over the Pirates 3-1. to one. Meanwhile, the St. Louis Cardinals back on the field taking on the Chicago White Sox and the Cards. 
pick up the win in that one, 8-5, to five, the final from Chicago. Big 12 football media days continue down in Dallas, Texas. Four coaches yesterday took to the podium on day two to talk about the 2015 season, including Oklahoma State head coach Mike Gundy. The Cowboys played a brutal schedule last season, playing six games against top 25 opponents, including opening up the season against the defending champion Florida State Seminoles. Gundy says his squad is ready to open up the season and make some noise in the always tough Big 12 Conference. Oklahoma Sooners head coach Bob Stoops yesterday also speaking to the media. The Sooners are coming off a disappointing season by their standards, finishing with an overall record of 8-5, and five, including 5-4 five and four in the conference. Stoops says do not expect to see a season like that again. The United States men's national soccer team tonight will continue their quest for the record time sixth Gold Cup Championship. The U.S. will face Jamaica in the semifinals, hoping to clinch a spot in Sunday's tournament finals with a win. America will face the winner of Panama and Mexico, but the Jamaicans are not going to be a walk in the park. They're a big, strong, uh, physical team that, that has good pace, that can play on the counterattack, and, and we need to make sure we try to sort out any issues uh, be, before they become dangerous, you know, whether it's a tactical foul, um, whether it's making sure we keep the ball and not giving the ball away you know, cheaply or easily. Uh, and then when you know, we do have the ball, we have to take our chances. We have to, to try and you know, score probably early on. Still to come, why citizens with guns are standing guard at military centers around the country. That's ahead. Plus a check of the seven-day forecast when the KOAM Morning News returns. All right, up and at them, 547 on a Wednesday morning. Pretty nice out there this morning. Not quite as... Uh warm and muggy as, as it was yesterday morning and did turn into a pretty nice Tuesday afternoon. Well, on a Wednesday morning, there is some rain in the area and then mid-90s for Friday, Saturday and on into the first week. And after Thursday, it looks like just mainly very warm and dry weather. But we'll have one more day where we get some relief from the uh, July heat which is going to be back here soon enough. So enjoy it while you can. Yeah, anything in the 80s, that is relief. This, this time of year, sure is. All right, thanks, Dave. Armed volunteers are guarding military recruiting centers across the country after four Marines and a sailor were shot and killed in Chattanooga, Tennessee last week. Now, federal regulations prohibit recruiters and other military personnel from being armed. As Hannah Daniels reports from New York, some lawmakers are calling for the Pentagon to change that policy. Armed with AR-15s and handguns, scores of volunteers are popping up at military recruiting centers across the country. They say they want to protect servicemen and women here, who are prohibited by law from being armed themselves. I grew up in this country. I live in this country. This is the least we can do. The movement began after Mohammed Abdulaziz shot dozens of rounds at a recruiting center in Chattanooga, Tennessee last week, before killing four Marines and a sailor at a military training center a few miles away. It, it just makes you sick to your stomach. Republican Senator Steve Daines and Republican Representative Duncan Hunter are among a handful of lawmakers who believe the best line of defense going forward would be to allow military personnel at recruitment centers to be armed. At his nomination hearing for Army Chief of Staff, General General Mark Milley says he believes that should be examined. I think under certain conditions we should seriously consider it. In some cases I think it's appropriate. Some argue the move could present other safety concerns. We have to be very careful about the policy, a uh, one blanket policy kind of over overriding sort of the common sense of each station commander. For now, these everyday citizens say they'll be doing their part to keep the service members safe. Henna Daniels, CBS News. Defense Secretary Ash Carter has ordered a full review of security policies at military installations due at the end of the week. A newly released dash cam video of the traffic stop involving a 28-year-old woman who died in police custody is fueling more questions than answers. It shows a Texas state trooper pulling over Sandra Bland for failing to signal a lane change and then threatening her with a taser when she failed to get out of her car. Authorities have said Bland hanged herself in her jail cell days after the incident, but her family does not believe it. Just ahead, a Senate hearing looking into America's immigration policies.
An emotional day here in Washington for the family of a San Francisco woman who was murdered by an undocumented immigrant. I'm Weijia Jang on Capitol Hill with what her father is asking from Congress coming up. And Donald Trump campaigns in South Carolina despite growing calls for him to drop out of the race. You're watching the KOAM Morning News. More real news after this. Topping Nation Watch this morning, the father of a murdered woman allegedly at the hands of an undocumented immigrant testifies before Congress. His daughter's death was a national tragedy. Jim Stanley's testimony came during a Senate hearing looking into America's immigration policies. Weijia Zhang is on Capitol Hill with more details. Act. Family members of people murdered by illegal immigrants spoke out to Congress, including Jim Steinle, whose daughter was murdered as they walked arm in arm along a San Francisco pier earlier this month. Suddenly a shot rang out. Kate fell and looked at me and said, help me, Dad. Those are the last words I will ever hear from my daughter. The suspect was released from jail this spring despite a lengthy criminal record because San Francisco is a sanctuary city, which means it has laws sheltering immigrants from deportation. San Francisco is proudly calls itself a sanctuary city. They're not hiding it. They're proud of it. Lawmakers in both the House and the Senate have introduced bills that would strip sanctuary cities of federal funding if they continue to ignore immigration law. I don't want the sympathy. I want you to do something about it. Everyone who's sitting here is in a position to do something. But immigration activists such as Grace and Martinez worry Congress will overreact. In moments like this, it's important to sit back, to breathe, and to think about the comprehensive solutions that we can bring about together. Her group has sent a letter to Congress urging members to preserve sanctuary cities. Weijia Jang, CBS News, Capitol Hill. The House plans to take up its version of the sanctuary city bill later this week. Donald Trump campaigns in South Carolina as many call for him to quit the Republican presidential race, especially after attacking Senator John McCain's military record. But the celebrity businessman yesterday did not tone down the rhetoric at his campaign rally. He even gave out Senator Lindsey Graham's cell phone number after the South Carolina senator spoke a few choice words about the billionaire. Trump is ignoring calls to leave the race and says he will not run as a third party candidate. Graham says he is probably getting a new phone number. <laughs> Can you imagine? It's 557. Here's your Wednesday weather. Another pretty nice day today. A break from the heat. We will see a chance for rain today, but our high temperature only 84. More real news ahead. A thief steals a half a dozen cars from a southwest Missouri dealership. Now the suspect helped the authorities track himself down. And a report from a truck driver leads to an arrest for animal cruelty. Why the Joplin Police Department says this story is a perfect example of seeing wrong and doing right. You're watching the KOAM Morning News. We'll be right back. What you can do if you encounter a child trapped in a hot car. And a woman dies after her pickup truck slides into a lake. The four states most watched news starts now. Good morning. Welcome to the KOAM Morning News. It's 6 o'clock on a Wednesday. I'm Dave Pilot. And I'm Tanya Bach. Coming up this half hour, injectable drugs used to treat diabetes could have another benefit. Dr. James Hoff joins us in our morning exam with a potential positive side effect. And a universal flu vaccine is in the works. More on that in Health Watch. Right now, a check of the weather. It's been pretty quiet overnight, but just in the past couple of hours, we've been seeing some rain develop in parts of southeast Kansas, southwest Missouri, showers around Pittsburgh over towards Lamar. We're not finished with summertime heat, but we've been enjoying a break from it yesterday, and we will again today. And it wouldn't hurt to see some rain around. It's gotten kind of dry in parts of the four-state area. I'd say I was on the softball fields last night, and the, the dirt's just blowing You're everywhere. Dusty. Infield. Yeah, very dusty. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks, You Dave. win? One game, yeah.
<laughs> well, what to do when a child is in distress? We see stories every year about babies who've been left locked in a car. But when is breaking a window or trying to the best solution? The Joplin Police Department says your first move should be to call 911. After that, it's a matter of assessing the situation. If the child's moving around and sweating, that's a good sign. You know, if your child's red-faced, if they're very lethargic, not moving, it shows they're more in more of a distress at that point. But if it comes time you have to break in that window or get access to the car, you just have to use whatever measures you have necessary to accomplish it at that time. It is legal in Missouri to leave a child over the age of 10 in your vehicle. Kansas has no specific laws about leaving infants in a vehicle. Although a parent could face charges of criminal negligence or child endangerment. The Newton County Sheriff's Office says the death of a toddler was an accident. The department says 18-month-old Carly Nichols was in the care of a neighbor when she fell into a hot tub. You can't take your eye off child for a minute. This was a hot tub inside a house that no one would expect something like this to happen. But with a child, it's certainly possible. The county coroner is still reviewing the death. No charges are expected. Authorities recovered the body of a woman from her truck submerged in a lake. Emergency crews yesterday were called to the City Park Lake in Mulberry, Kansas, where a pickup was submerged in the water. Inside, they recovered the body of 52-year-old Venice Little of Minden Mines, Missouri. Investigators believe she had driven too close to the bank and then lost traction in the wet grass. Two other women were passengers in the truck. Passengers in the vehicle when the water, uh, when the truck entered the water, both of them were able to uh, escape the vehicle before it became submerged, and their efforts to get Miss Little out of the vehicle were unsuccessful. Those two women got out through a passenger side window. Little's body has been sent to, the can to Kansas City for an autopsy. A man arrested for hindering prosecution in a Joplin homicide changes his plea. Aiden Bautista changed his plea to guilty and is sentenced to time served 15 days in the county jail. The charges stem from a homicide at this home back in November. Mascadano Lopez was found dead from blunt force trauma. He'd apparently been beaten in the head with a board. Leonardo Mendoza is charged with first degree murder and armed criminal action in connection with his death. Bautista told police that he, the suspect, and the victim, who were all roommates, were assaulted by two black men. He later recanted that story. The OSHA Missouri police tracked down a suspected car thief with a little help from the suspect himself. Police say someone stole six cars from this Neosho dealership early Sunday. Police had little evidence and no suspects until Monday. And that's when investigators say the alleged thief made a grab at a seventh car. As the suspect came to get that seventh vehicle, a friend of the business owner just happened to be driving by the dealership. He followed the car and alerted authorities. And my buddy Cal, Cal Burnett, said, Charlie, they're getting you again. So I came out with the shotgun, and of course there wasn't nobody here. And he said, I'm following them now. I'm on Baxter Street. We're doing 80. I said, did you call 911? He said, yeah. Keys to every vehicle on the lot, as well as for the shop and office, were stolen in the initial robbery, along with a handful of dealer plates. Joplin police credit a semi-truck driver for possibly saving a dog. Police say, now this case is unique. KOM's Jordan Abbey reports. Police say this story is a perfect example of seeing wrong than doing right. The unusualness in this case is this person's not even from around here, and so he's going above and beyond uh, reporting something where you know he's not even from here. A short time ago, David Jeffries, a truck driver from Independence, Missouri, was passing through the Missouri FF and Interstate 49 intersection. I noticed there was two people and a dog. One of those people was 49-year-old Charles Wilson. And I saw him hit this dog. And then he hit it again with a slap. Jeffrey says these were strong slaps, one right after the other. The hits continued after Jeffrey's turned out of the intersection. Jeffrey says Wilson went from slapping and punching the dog with his fist to kicking the dog. The dog was cowering the whole time. I knew if I got out of that truck and he would have said some smart aleck remark or something, 
my temper would probably would have took over because I was pretty upset. So Jeffries called police, who arrested Wilson and charged him with animal abuse. Police say Wilson and the woman he was with are homeless. He's obviously going to move on down the road, I would guess, so, but he still doesn't have the right to abuse his animals. The dog is now in the care of Joplin's Humane Society, where workers there say it doesn't appear the dog is hurt. We weren't allowed to record the dog because Wilson's criminal case is ongoing and he could get his dog back. Police say there could have been a different outcome if Jeffries decided not to intervene. I'm a dog lover myself. I have I've had dogs all my life. Watch a dog get beat up like that. In Joplin, Jordan Abbey, KOAM News. The man arrested by police faces a misdemeanor charge. 607. Here's a check of the seven day forecast. We have a chance for rain today, but we won't be quite so hot. Our high temperature, 84. Here at KOAM, we are proud to honor our four state heroes. This morning, we salute a Vietnam War veteran, Captain Bob Thornberry. He served in the U.S. Navy from 1951 to 1971. His hometown, Asbury, Missouri. We are proud to salute Bob Thornberry, our four state hero. That's a look at this morning's top stories and weather in our first seven minutes. Coming up on the KOAM Morning News, a drug used to treat diabetes could help protect against Parkinson's disease. We'll have more on that in Health Watch. And a category of diabetes drugs could help people lose weight. Dr. James Hoff joins us in our morning exam with how the drugs work. You're watching the KOAM Morning News. More real news in the morning. We'll be right back. Welcome back on a Wednesday morning. It's pretty nice this morning, certainly compared to the muggy weather we had yesterday morning. Our sunrise coming up here in a few minutes at 6.15. Well, here's a look at what's going on around town. Pittsburgh Community Theater presents Evita. It's one of the first times it's been presented in our area, July 23rd, so uh, through the 26th, opening up tomorrow at Memorial Auditorium. General admission tickets are only $8. Get more details at memorialauditorium.org. See, the Carthage Public Library's summer reading program continues today with the theme, Meet Local Heroes, like your firemen, police, sheriff, highway patrol, and military. That's today from 10 to 11.30 at the Public Library in Carthage. And a reminder, this is the last program of the summer. Also in Carthage on Saturday, it's a benefit for Wounded Warrior Project starting at noon at the city park. They'll have music, food, a rummage sale, quilt raffle. It's free to attend and all the Donations go to the Wounded Warriors Project. We'll be right back with a check of weather. Topping Health Watch this morning, new research finds it may be possible to create a universal flu vaccine. Normally, scientists produce a vaccine each year to protect against common strains of the virus that season. But now they're finding success with a vaccine they're testing on mice that offers broad protection no matter which strains of the flu are prevalent. 60, excuse me, 60 percent of adults and 50 percent of youth ages 8 to 15 who have a mental illness got no help last year. What can we do to get help for more people? Dal Quick looks at one solution. How are you doing today, Xavier? Uh, I'm doing pretty fine. When 12-year-old Xavier Davidson meets with his psychiatrist, it's as easy as opening his laptop. Are you having any type of side effects at all? Dr. Vashon Omar Williams' office is a three-hour round-trip drive from Xavier's home. But a secure video conferencing line eliminates that distance with a few computer strokes. Are you able to sleep well at nighttime? Yes, sir. Um, his behavior is way better. And I think that's because he's been active in basketball. Monique, Xavier's mother, says managing her son's ADHD is so much easier now. She can often set up a same-day appointment. And that reason is because our practitioners can be anywhere and our client can be anywhere. Anna Basnick heads the nonprofit group that's setting up telepsychiatry throughout Florida. For people who live hours away from the nearest psychiatrist, this provides a lifeline. Some of our, our clients are Medicaid clients, and transportation is an issue, missing work is an issue, um, taking kids out of school is an issue. You might think the video sessions lack an important human touch, but Basnick says when it comes to treating children and teens, video conferencing actually is more effective. Practitioners are getting much more information from the children because they're much more comfortable on iPhones, on 
you know, social media and all that. So they're opening up more. So, all right, Xavier, keep up the good work. I'm proud of you, sir. Dow Quick. KOAM News. United Healthcare, Oscar, WellPoint, and some Blue Cross Blue Shield plans have also recently adopted telemedicine programs. A drug used to treat diabetes may help protect against Parkinson's disease. New research in London finds people who take glitazone and anti-diabetes drugs have a 28% lower incidence of Parkinson's disease. Well, people who had low birth weights and then later developed unhealthy habits could be at greater risk of developing type 2 diabetes. In a new study, Harvard researchers found 18% of new type 2 diabetes cases were linked to low birth weight and habits, including smoking or eating poorly. And injectable drugs used to treat diabetes could help people lose weight. Dr. James Hoff is here. He'll join us in our morning exam with how the drugs work. But first, it's 617. And time for your weather on the sevens on a Wednesday morning. Very pleasant morning. Temperatures uh, in the uh, 70s, but uh, just not as warm and muggy as it uh, was yesterday morning. We do have a little bit of rain in the area. Some scattered showers showing up. AOAM Morning News will be right back. Mercy Hospital's Dr. James Hoff is joining us again this morning. And today's topic for our morning medical exam is about diabetes drugs and how they actually have another benefit, a different kind of side yeah, effect. Yeah, they do. There's a, there's a category of drugs that came out within the last couple of years that actually help people to lose weight. As uh, most people with diabetes uh, can tell you, their diabetes drugs main, uh, make them gain weight, especially insulin. But there's this new category of drugs, GLP-1 receptor agonists, fancy name, name yeah. <laughs> uh, that are injectable drugs. You inject them uh, once or twice a month, and they seem to help people lose weight. And it seems what they do is they help decrease your craving. So they've tested it, and you know the theory. Th this is still theory; nobody knows. But when people who are overweight want to eat, they get an intense pleasure out of thinking about the food, and then they don't get as much pleasure from eating the food. And these drugs, Bietta and Victoza, change that around. So when they're when they're confronted with, oh, that looks like a really tasty sugary treat, the Bietta and Victoza decrease your brain's desire to, to have it, and then when you eat it, you actually get more pleasure from it. So, I mean, it's an amazing it's drug. It's a win-win situation. It's a win-win situation, yeah. yeah, and people lose weight. They've, uh, um, people with diabetes can lose up to about 5% of their body weight just by being on the drug. You and were saying these drugs only needed to be injected once or twice a month? That's so? right. Yeah, about every... That's yeah. another benefit. Yeah, exactly. There, you know, there are some local, you know, people can get side effects, local reactions to the injection, but, you know, they're really well tolerated. They're probably well better tolerated than most of the other diabetes medications. Now, are these drugs already on the market? They are. They've been out um, probably, you know, three to five years, something like that. Uh, Bietta is the one that's uh, best known. Uh, there's another pill called Victo. I'm sorry, another injection called Victoza. Uh, and interestingly, in December of last year, a company changed Victoza into a weight loss drug called Sexenda. And so what they did is they took Victoza, they made it more uh, a higher dose. The Food and Drug Administration approved it for weight loss, and so now it's approved for people even without diabetes to help them lose weight. Oh, that's very interesting. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So uh, there had been some debate about whether people without diabetes should be using these drugs to uh, lose weight, and now it turns out that they can because there's a, there's a drug available for them. All right. Well, very helpful information this morning, and thank you so much for coming again. No problem. Thank you for having me again. We'll be right back. It's 627. Here's a check of your Wednesday weather. A chance for rain is in our forecast for today, along with some cooler weather. Our high today, only 84. More real news ahead, including what you can do if you encounter a child trapped in a hot car. We talked with the Joplin Police Department about the best thing to do in that situation. And a crowdfunding campaign moving one small step at a time. Why the Smithsonian is partnering with Kickstarter to save a piece of history. You're watching the KOAM Morning News. We'll be right back. what you can do if you encounter a child trapped in a hot car. 
and a woman dies after her pickup truck slides into a lake. The four states most watched news starts now. Good morning. Welcome to the KOAM Morning News. It is 6.30 on a Wednesday. I'm Dave Pilot. And I'm Tanya Bach. Coming up this half hour, the suit that made history. The Smithsonian launches an online fundraising campaign to fund the restoration and preservation of Neil Armstrong's space suit. He used to walk on the moon. That's ahead. And we'll try to make another pet connection with you in the Southeast Kansas Humane Society. Right now, a check of the weather. And it's been pretty quiet overnight. Uh, this morning, we do have a bit of rain in the area through Southeast Kansas. This time of year, that's not too bad. We really don't have any, uh, what you would call, extreme heat uh, like we've seen here in recent summers. So, looking pretty good. Maybe uh, some folks will see some rain. If you need it, hopefully you'll get some. Yeah, none of that extreme heat today. No, or for the next several days. All right, thanks, mm. Dave. What to do when a child is in distress? We see stories every summer and winter about babies who've been left locked in a car. It happened recently in Kansas, and a woman took matters into her own hands. But when is breaking a window or trying to the best solution? Here's KOM's Tim Spears. You see a locked car, closed windows, a child inside with no parents in sight. What do you do? My first reaction would probably be like go into the shop where the car is parked and, and let someone know. I don't know what I would do, but I would think that I would stay next to the car just, you know, and watch the baby. Obviously, you want to rescue a child, but it's still property damage if you broke somebody's window at the same time. So it's like. Sergeant Rusty Rive says before breaking a car window, call 911. A, it starts help your way because you're going to need that eventually. B, if the child is in medical distress, it'll also start as emergency services. In Merriam, Kansas, a woman tried desperately to break the front driver's window with a tire iron when faced with a similar situation. Even with the tool, this rescue attempt lasted minutes. Rive says the public is most needed as eyes and ears of first responders. The big thing for us is we need accurate information to get you help, and then we need proper assessment. Because while there are window punches and specific hammers available for general public, the chances of someone actually carrying one of those around with them and ever productively using it are very slim. This toddler was eventually rescued, now doing fine. Rive says people should be on the look for telltale signs of when a situation becomes dangerous. If the child's moving around and sweating, that's a good sign. You know, if your child's red-faced, if they're very lethargic, not moving, shows they're more in more of a distress at that point. When faced with a situation where a child does need immediate help, the best option is just grabbing whatever's nearest, like this rock, and going for a window farthest from the child. You just have to use whatever measures you have necessary to accomplish it at that time. In Joplin, Tim Spears, KOEM News. It is legal in Missouri to leave a child over the age of 10 in your vehicle. And Kansas has no specific laws about leaving infants in a vehicle, although a parent could face charges of criminal negligence or child endangerment. Investigators say the death of a toddler in Newton County, Missouri, was an accident. A neighbor was caring for 18-month-old Carly Nichols south of Joplin when the girl fell into a hot tub. The neighbor tried to revive the toddler with CPR but was unsuccessful. Authorities recover the body of a woman from her truck submerged in a lake. Two other women managed to escape. Crawford County, Kansas authorities received a call around 3.40 yesterday morning of a truck submerged in the Mulberry City Park Lake. KOM's Car Carly Willis reports. Authorities found 52-year-old Venice Little of Minden Mines, Missouri inside the submerged pickup. Little was the owner of Big Little Mini Mart, which sits just outside of Mulberry on State Line Road. Residents by the lake said they heard women's voices at the park as early as 2 a.m. I heard uh, vehicles in the park earlier that morning. Then my wife was listening. You could hear it sound like vehicles spinning out and stuff like that. And that was after 2 o'clock in the morning. Authorities say there were two other women in the vehicle when it entered the water. They were identified as Sherry West of Laysen, Kansas, and Mandy Umfenauer of Millbury. Both of them were able to uh, escape the vehicle before it became submerged, and their efforts to get Miss Little out of the vehicle were unsuccessful. Investigators believe Little had driven too close to the bank, then lost traction in the wet grass. But there's no official word yet on whether alcohol was involved. We can only speculate as to, you know, the circumstances surrounding it, um, and also the toxicology um, of, of the driver as well as the passengers. In Mulberry, Kansas, Carly Willis, KOAM News. 
Little lived in Minden Mines, Missouri. Her body has been sent to Kansas City for an autopsy. Neosho, Missouri police tracked down a man suspected of stealing six cars and attempting to steal a seventh from this Neosho dealership early Sunday. Police had little evidence and no suspects until Monday. That's when investigators say the alleged thief made a grab at a seventh car. As the suspect came to get the seventh vehicle, a friend of the business owner just happened to be driving by the dealership. He followed the car and alerted authorities. Authorities are still looking to recover five vehicles. More arrests could be coming. It's just about 6.37. Here's a check of weather and a break from the heat today. We'll have a chance for rain and expect a high of 84. That's a look at this morning's top stories and weather in our first seven minutes. Coming up on the KOAM Morning News, a close-up look at the space suit that protected Neil Armstrong during his historic trip to the moon. And the crowdfunding campaign the Smithsonian is launching to help restore it. And a warning for millions of Americans who rely on prepaid debit cards to pay the bills. That's ahead. You're watching the KOAM Morning News. More real news in the morning. We'll be right back. Hey, welcome back. Let's get to the birthdays today. All right, let's first kick it off with our celebrity birthday. Former Senate Majority Leader Bob Dole, the Republican from Kansas. He's 92. All right, and now for our question of the day. Who was president when Apollo 11 landed on the moon? John Kennedy, Richard Nixon, or Gerald Ford? We'll be back with the answer. Up and Adam, Wednesday morning. We've got another nice day ahead with temperatures that will be below normal for this time of year, but uh, things are going to be heating up starting tomorrow. Up to 90 tomorrow and then into the mid 90s for the weekend with a heat index that will be over 100 degrees this coming Saturday and Sunday. Here's the answer to our question of the day. Who was president when Apollo 11 landed on the moon? John Kennedy, Richard Nixon, Gerald Ford. The answer was Richard Nixon. Well, the spacesuit that protected Neil Armstrong during the historic landing on the moon has been behind closed doors for the last decade. But now the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum is turning to Kickstarter to raise $500,000 in 30 days to help restore the suit and return it to the museum's public exhibition. Chris Van Cleve is at the Air and Space Museum in Washington with a look at the suit that made history. The spacesuit that took one giant leap for mankind there's a nick down here is showing its age. Capcom or go for landing. In 1969, the world watched as Neil Armstrong became the first man to walk on the moon and he did it in this. But before the Smithsonian can take the small step of putting it back on display, Lisa Young's got some very expensive work to do. Time is taking its toll and it's to the layers you don't see. So the interior rubber bladder is becoming brittle and is breaking. You see a visible change in uh, the materials themselves. This is your chance to be a part of history. Marking the 46th anniversary of Apollo 11's moon landing, the National Air and Space Museum launched a Kickstarter crowdfunding effort to, in their words, reboot the suit. 64 percent of the Smithsonian's 1.3 billion dollar budget comes from the federal government. The rest from donors and grants. Crowdfunding is a new frontier for the institution as it hopes to raise a half million dollars in 30 days to fund the preservation of Armstrong's historic spacesuit. The museum's hope is the campaign builds a connection with those who weren't around to watch it live. Just don't get too close to the suit. Can I touch it? No. <laughs> The work will take three years and require x-rays and CT scans to make a complete 3D digital scan of the suit that can live on forever. Armstrong's Apollo 11 suit joined the Smithsonian's collection in 1976, but hasn't been on display for the last 10 years. The goal is to have it ready for the lunar landing's 50th anniversary in 2019. The real key to the story of that spacesuit is the man that was inside of it and, and what it did to help him explore this other world. Professor James Hansen is Armstrong's official biographer. Along with that spacesuit and its story, uh, I think the story of Neil Armstrong, who he was, why was he chosen, I think the, the, the Smithsonian is, is, and its curators are, are very wise in knowing that that's a two-part story that needs to be told. There he is, there's a foot coming down the steps. A story that with your help will be told again and again, allowing generations of stargazers to experience that one man's 
one small step. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. If you ever go to Washington, that's something you ought to see, the Air and Space Museum at the Smithsonian. And hopefully they'll have that suit on display. Yeah. Well, you're watching the KOAM Morning News. We're back after the break. Welcome back. Time again to see if we can make another pet connection with you in the Southeast Kansas Humane Society. Melissa and Erica back with us as always. And this morning we're going to double down. Yes. We've, we've got the sisters with us this morning. We've got sisters. This is Dottie and Crystal. Uh, we know a parent was a boxer. We don't know what the other parent was. Okay. We think they're going to be as big as a boxer. Okay. They're about 14 weeks now. So, so they're still pups. They're still puppies. They're very, very sweet, very friendly, very energetic, love to play with and wrestle with each other. How long have they been with you? A few weeks. Okay. And then there were four females. There's one more female at the shelter. So okay. It's too early for her to get up. But <laughs> these two are ready to go. I know the feeling. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the last time you were here, you had another kind of a boxer mix, and unfortunately, he's still at the shelter. Those are still waiting for his forever no. home. Yeah, come and see him. He's a great dog. Okay. We've got a couple more here, and these, again, are are still young and uh, you can kind of get them trained and yep. raise them like you want them. Yeah, mm -hmm. they're, they're good kids. Erica, you want to talk about the, something coming up next month? Yeah, we have our 15th annual Bull Rama. It's going to be August 29th. It's a Saturday at Holiday Lanes in Pittsburgh. And we are accepting team sponsorships with our $225 for a six person team and also advertising sponsors for the event. And that's a $50 sponsorship. And this is one of our biggest fundraising events. So. Okay. So we're starting early to get the word yep. out and people can kind of get their teams organized yep. and get yep. ready to go. And hopefully advertisers will also jump yep. on board with yeah. you. Yeah. It's a fun night. Yeah, okay. And, and one of the bigger fundraisers that you guys have. Uh, one thing about adopting a dog, I was wondering if you had any advice on this. Can it affect like your homeowner's uh, insurance policy? There are certain breeds that I found out that your homeowner's insurance policy um, they either require you to have a certain height of a fence mm -hmm. or um, extra coverage. So okay. you'll need to check with that, your policyholder okay. and see what those dogs are. But probably not these. Not these guys. They're not on that list, no. Nope. Okay. And their names again are? Dottie and Crystal. Okay, Dottie and Crystal looking for a good home. You can take one. You can take two. You can take, take three. all you want. Take yep, three that's if right. You want to <laughs> keep the sisters all together. Yes. <laughs> Thank you all again, as always, for our pet connection. Thank you. Thank we'll you. We'll be right back. It's 6.57, and here's the seven-day forecast. We'll see a chance of rain today, tonight, and tomorrow, but we'll uh, continue to enjoy cooler than normal weather today with a high of 84, but we're back into the mid-90s this weekend. Well, millions of Americans do not have bank accounts, so many rely on prepaid debit cards to pay the bills. But cyber thieves figured out how to steal money from people with one type of prepaid card by starting a fake website. Julie Watts reports. Karen Martin pays her bills with a reloaded prepaid debit card. But one day after she loaded $500 onto her card using the reloaded website, her money was gone. Matter of fact, it said I was negative. $3.05. In a statement, Reloaded says Karen's money was stolen via a fraudulent phishing website cloned to look like the real Reloaded website. Turns out she logged on to the wrong one. Here's the real Reloaded site, and here's the fake. The fake has an E at the end and doesn't begin with HTTPS. It would ask you to log in with your Reloaded credentials, and then they use your credentials to go to your actual Reloaded account and take your money. The Electronic Frontier Foundation's Noah Schwartz explains they're called phishing sites. People unknowingly navigate to the fakes via fraudulent email links or online search results, then enter sensitive information which the bad guys steal. To avoid them, you have to know what to look for. Always look for HTTPS. The S indicates it's a secure site and you should never enter sensitive information without it. Reloaded has now agreed to refund Karen that $500 and after nearly four months, that fake site was finally shut down. For CBS News, Julie Watts, San Francisco. Good advice. Always look for the S mm -hmm. after that HTTP. Well, coming up today at noon, former Oklahoma Marines set up post outside military recruiting stations to help protect the men who currently serve us. Plus, are you on track to meet your financial goals? We take a quick mid-year money checkup. 
in a Mr. Food recipe for Parmesan crusted cauliflower. Join us for those stories and, of course, much more today on the KOAM News at Noon. Tomorrow morning, a recent report finds summer youth employment plunged nearly 40% over the past 12 years. What one local official says about the summer job market in southwest Missouri. That'll wrap it up for now. Have a great Wednesday. We'll see you back here tomorrow morning. And we'll see you today at noon.